Okay? Should we go to the role concept now? Mm -hmm. Yes. <coughs> Good. So, as you know, this is, I got the EBMA for that, and I'm very grateful to Günther Mohr, my ex-pupil and colleague and trainer at my institute as well in Germany who did me the favor to suggest that I sh uh, should get it. And what I'm proud of is what Monique Tunissen said, Schmidt made TA really organizational. It's not yet totally true, but we are on the way to... <laughs> Uh, this is a picture who shows you the three worlds model. I will go into that later. As a personality model on the left side. And as like in TA, as a model for, under, uh, for encounter and communication on the other side. So that's very similar to the basic structure of TA models. I expanded the idea of ego states to the uh, as a personality be divided into ego states into a personality personality be divided into roles. So it's an expansion of the ego state model, but you can almost uh, do everything with the role model that you learn to do with the ego state model. And I only give you examples for, examples for that. Otherwise it would be boring to repeat everything. And it's a personality model on the one hand, <coughs> and it's a communication model on the other hand. And I defined the role as a coherent system. Do you know these words? like ego states of attitudes, feelings, behaviors, and now in addition, perspectives on reality, or frame of references, and accompanying relationships. If you have this understanding of reality, then you have this idea about how relationships are about. So, the expansion of the understanding of paths on a personality is that they certainly have to be described in terms of frame of reference and related to others in the definition. It's within the definition. It's not defining a person and then relating. It's a person is a related entity. It is an entity you only can understand when you understand the perspectives on reality of that entity. That's part of the sub essential, substantial part of the definition of personality. So, if you uh, use the role model to describe personality, as we already had with the theater metaphor. The role model was earlier than the theater metaphor. This is why it's only focused on roles. You could do the same thing on stages, styles, and all these things that are in the theater metaphor. The role model is at least 20 years old. So the C personality as a portfolio of his, her roles. And the notion of roles certainly includes in which play are these roles played. So it's a implicit connection to being in the world. And if you ask for the uniqueness 
of the individual in the role model, it's always didactic. I'm not saying it is that way that person is only role. It's didactic to elicit specific questions we should answer. The uniqueness, uniqueness of a person is expressed not besides the roles in society, but by the way they play their roles in society. So, the essence is in the how. How you uniquely play your roles. There are roles who give you more, sp more space for being unique in that, like an actor. And there are also roles who do you not give you <coughs> very much space to do so if you are a bus driver. In style, you could put a, a lot of uniqueness into it, but not in, in the um, technical uh, characteristics of the role. And the role model connects people with place and stages in their roles. Within the definition, by definition. Thus personality is also a matter of context and content. So the difference to classical, when I first wrote about roles uh, from this perspective, I got some uh, very critical comments saying, oh, roles, this is, these are the definitions of society, the expectations of the society on the one hand, and there's personality on the other hand, and then we have the personality, uh, the person has to be somehow cope with expectations of the society. So the def definition is put in a way that roles are not uh, not describing self-organization of a person, but only expectations from outside. So by definition, there's uh, opened a gap between human and, ro and role expectation, and you have the question how to overcome this gap. In my, def my, but not, my definition is different. It's not the classical so sociological definition. It's saying role is a way to put self-organization of a person within his or her reality. Then if, if you do this, you don't have the problem uh, in connecting uh, a person with roles because a person is a bundle of roles. And then you have different questions. And I think that shifts it from the sociological model to uh, much more of a psychological. Yes. I would not call it psychological because my, I would not call it psychological because my, I always try to, uh, to describe people, uh, in ways that can also be psychologically interpreted, but you do not have, you do not need psycho psychology to understand how roles are functioning. I, I think from that perspective, the, the definition you've just done, yeah, that it's about self-definition. Yes. Um, within the TA world, yeah, I think for you to be heard, yeah, it's important to emphasize that this is a psychological model because there is mm. often a dismissing of social sociological models yeah. and and that idea of self-definition and self-structuring is very psychological yeah maybe it would be a bridge but i do not I just do not, not agree to that build. no <laughs> because um, to understand my role is also understand for example how i'm doing with money around my role. That's not psychological. The motivations on that might be so, uh, yeah, exactly. psychological. Attitudes to money and definitely Yeah, no, no, but, but this is something you put in, that the question of money, you connect with the questions of uh, uh, psychological processes, but you don't have to do that. Uh, we, that's an habitual pattern we learned. Because we can put the notion of motivation or internal processes to everything, we think everything is psychological. But this is not the character of the thing, it's the 
the spotlight we put on it. I think it depends what you mean by psychological. Mm -hmm. Because when I think um, of attitudes, thinking, perspective on reality, mm -hmm. those to me are all things which happen in the mind. Mm -hmm. and, and therefore, in my frame, that would be psychological. Okay. When you, when you say this, is yes. every self-organization of, mm -hmm. in, of the individual you call psychological? I would call it psychological because it's held in mind, consciously or unconsciously. How would you call it? I'm just curious because yeah. it's very intriguing. No, I, 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 would, I, I, would, I would just not put it in terms of classical sciences. I would just would not do it. Call it the either or the other way. It's it's a way to understand self-organization of a person, and the psychological perspective is one of it. Mm -hmm. well, tell, us, tell, us, tell us what you mean by psychological or psychology. The classical association with psychology uh, are to understand how um, the self-organization right now is a product of development of uh, m motivations uh, of um, dealing with energy, dealing with transferences, all these concepts that usually are associated with psychology. And when I use the term psychology, I automatically uh, um, call for the response of all these kinds of descriptions. But you can work with the role concept, for example, when you work with the role concept within the theater metaphor, without inviting all these contexts and all these concepts. Mm -hmm. So this is why I do not want to use this, um, the term psychology for it, because it inevitably um, activates backgrounds within professionals that I do not want to activate. I, I want to teach them to leave them in the background and activate other backgrounds. I, I hear your purpose and, yes. and, and don't disagree. And certainly in many contexts, I avoid the word psychology, mm -hmm. especially because it is very everyday and, mm -hmm. and understandable. Mm -hmm. And I do think there's something sometimes with, with fellow professionals which is quite important. Yeah, it's a question of pacing and leading. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe I'm too radical on that. And and very often I'm misunderstood and maybe I provoke that. People always, when they want to hear something new, at 50% they want to sort it into the boxes they already have. And I, I'm not too friendly uh, to the boxes they already have because I want to teach the new boxes. <laughs> I think what, what you mention I mean, what comes to my mind and what you're mentioning is what we call in Italy psychologizing. Yes. You know? So yeah. we, we right. think that people often tend to psychologize. Yeah. We, we use the verb psychologizing, yeah, which yeah. is we, really we getting use it a as well. focus. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and and using a, a frame of references to avoid focusing really on the issue. Right. Right. Uh, but this is a kind of manipulative way. It's, it's, it's a distorted way of using psychology. Good. So it's more, it's, it's more a, a, <coughs> a practical and strategic question of how to use language than, yeah. than a question of exactly. definitions right exactly. now. Exactly, exactly. That's what, what, what I think here. Yeah, and maybe uh, you are more prudent on that than I am. <laughs> well, what? More You're more prudent. 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 So uh, why is on that? Really giving people terms that they can, oh, yeah, that's me. <laughs> and not giving them terms that, oh, this this have something to do with what I've learned. Mm. But also, I think it makes sense to be protective of the idea yes. to make it available to lots of frames right. of reference. That's right. what I understand you're yes. saying, yeah. isn't yeah. it? That, that it's not, it's not, not it's with your yeah. psychological, it's not not organizational. It's right, right. Mm. Or to, let's bring it. My brother yeah. was here, he'd be talking, thinking about this in terms of an animal, physical, I don't know. Yes, yeah. yeah. So, I, I guess I need you 
to help that, to do that translation and that bridging. Mm-hmm. Um, it's almost like a person in the context of an ecosystem, and yeah. one ecosystem works in a certain way. Yeah. He moves to the other ecosystem and he adapts to the environment, mm-hmm. and the whole system changes. Mm-hmm. But the person is the same. Yes. But in in that metaphor, the, the person would then 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 be changing, absolutely, when, yeah. because the the number of the portfolio. Yeah, if you describe, change. if yeah. you put different yeah, lights right. on, the, the object is is not the same as it was in in the light of other spotlights. Mm-hmm. That's there is no person separate from the system. Yeah. 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 So, so you, you understand the idea and how it is different that the classical notions of roles and personality, yeah. it's not... Uh, it's a sociologist, uh, Niklas Luhmann in Germany, he's, <coughs> he's uh, underlining very much that things we usually try to... Um, to define separately are levels of the thing we want to um, describe. For example, he's, he does not say economy in our society, as and then you have the structural ideas as society, and one part of it is a common economy. He's saying the economy of our society. You can look at all our, the processes in our society from an econo, econo, Economological economy aspect, <laughs> uh, and that's the same with, for example, psychosomatic. If you talk about psychosomatic approaches, it's not enough to have a clinic and then have a department for psychosomatic. Psychosomatic is a perspective on how you are doing medicine, and this is why you should not uh, allow to make it a department. I give you some examples um, for what I said. As you can, I guess use any uh, any procedure you have learned with ego states as well with roles. At least check out whether that works or not. For example, role fixation in, instead of ego state fixation, role exclusion, role confusion. You also can talk about role contamination. Contamination in ego states was a chronic inclusion of elements of one ego state into another without awareness. This is a classical contamination definition and you certainly can use that for roles. The the inclusion of elements of (coughs) other roles uh, uh, in one role without being aware. Yeah. Yeah, for, so for example, if, if your role is to be a boss, you have the right uh, of defining what's go- what has to go on. If you are, on, you, you are in a relationship with colleagues, you might even be the more experienced. But if you include the idea that then you have the right to tell the other person where to go, this is, can call be called uh, con- role contamination. Mm. Yeah, and the um, difference between private roles mm-hmm. and professional roles, yeah. the contamination between those yeah. is extreme. There was a discussion this morning yeah. uh, on a TA website. Mm-hmm. Somebody has written, I want to teach managers to give private strokes mm-hmm. in, in the business context. Mm-hmm. Going, oh my God. What is this person wanting to do? Develop affairs in the mm. office? Mm. Or? Mm. <laughs> 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 right. um, such confusion. And this is, you know, these are people who are TA organization trained. Mm-hmm. Yes, they have the right intent, but I do, yeah. they do not understand to put it into a role perspective yeah. adequately. Yeah. And many managers do as well. Mm-hmm. They say, okay, we need to do something for our relationship, let's go have a beer mm-hmm. afterward. Some of it is cultural, right? For example, in India, very often, um, anyone who's a respected person, even within an organization, 
gets a parental status mm -hmm. pretty automatically. Gets a parental status. Parental status. Ah, okay. And only concerning the organizational mm -hmm. role relationship, or is this expanded for all expanded. relationships? Yeah, it gets expanded. Mm -hmm. I, 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 no, maybe not all relationships, but all areas of the individual's life sometimes becomes. Uh -huh. um, and, you know, you, you see it in certain very concrete gestures. For example, at a, um, <clears throat> an awards and recognition ceremony we had in our organization, yeah. when people were called up and an award was given to them, they would touch the feet mm -hmm. of the... Uh, of the boss, mm -hmm. which actually in India is a gesture of respect to elders. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, uh, you know, so there is a very overlapped, uh, there are, I mean, role <coughs> confusion and contamination is huge. Mm -hmm. I, I, I think it's, it's more a cultural connotation. Yeah. It's really the way and the gestures and the rituals yeah. that go with the something with, with a kind of recognition. Yeah. I, I don't think this what? is a contamination. I, I think it's a, it's a normal way in that mm. culture to recognize uh, the, uh, the value of elderly. And, for I, would, example. and um, I also would not uh, pathologize it. No. It's, it's just not differentiated. It's not a, exactly. we, we think it should be differentiated. Mm -hmm. And if we think that, then it's a confusion. But if you don't think that it's just all in one box in this cultural system, yes. then it's not a conf confusion. But you could think about whether yeah. this being all the same is a good idea for the future. Maybe it should be differentiated. Yeah, I, I mean, I agree with the idea of it being differentiated. Mm -hmm. I think that. So, what do you think should happen? Um, <clears throat> I think there should be greater clarity between when is a person performing. A professional role mm -hmm. and when has uh, you can have both I'm not saying that the two cannot exist mm -hmm. but I think uh, they overlap and professional uh, commitments are, are made because of a personal context sometimes mm -hmm. I, I yeah. don't understand what's wrong with somebody touching the feet of the boss if that's the cultural mm -hmm. piece in your country see it's not everybody it's not it's not across the board but I, I feel... Um, Does it belong to a specific social class? No, no, no. it's not limited it's by not social it. class. I'm, I'm everyone asking. does it. Everyone does it. Okay. Everyone does it. Not general. everyone, but in all classes. Yeah. In all classes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. all classes. The, so, when we meet our parents, we just touch, touch, touch yeah. their feet. And it's a gesture of so. Even if the uncles come, yeah. and we do that. But so it's, a, it's a gesture, not just of respect. It's a gesture of familial respect yeah. within a family. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And there is a lot of focus, very, con I don't think I've to date been a part of an organization that doesn't say we're all a big family. Yeah. Uh, and I find that problematic because I find family dynamics then work yeah. in a professional space. Sure. We're saying no and saying, uh, and how people are, um, you know, even move up depends on things that are not always performance based no. yeah. no, of course. and that's where the and, and this is just <laughs> indicators <laughs> but i think there is a lot right. more confusion right. mm -hmm. okay. so this is yeah. contamination of private world and professional absolutely world. Mm -hmm. absolutely yeah. mm -hmm. I, I i think this is a i think what you are posing is a very meaningful and interesting mm -hmm. question and mm -hmm. issue mm -hmm. uh, because um, uh, in italy i can i can give an example in terms of that Italy is one of the countries in Europe that has about 90% of its business based on family, yes, mm. family-owned business, that have developed a great deal. And the particularity in terms of that is that um, the, the organizations tend to repeat what, what has happened originally with the success of the family, like all organizations do, of mm. course. Now, one of the things that I found, I'll, I'll give you a very small example, was, for example, in Sicily, in one of the organizations where I went to, to train and consult, the, um, uh, it was the next generation that had taken over uh, the, the, the business. And the characteristic was that they didn't know how to conduct the business and they didn't want it to conduct it the way their parents had conducted it. One of the examples was that their parents used to invite their best clients over for lunch at, on Sunday. No, 
And this was quite a cooperative, if you think, you know, in the 50s or in the 60s in Italy that was quite rural with very few business, etc. It was not wrong. So there could be other ways to work on that. So the whole idea was to sort of consider what their culture was mm -hmm. and how certain things had been affected within that mm -hmm. culture. It was not right or wrong. Right. or appropriate or inappropriate, the, the question was what, what kind of ways could be imagined now to deal with clients mm -hmm. that could be effective mm -hmm. beyond the usual... Yeah. Uh, right. So, right. so I, I think we were addressing yeah. the same kind of issue in a way. Yeah. 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 And it's uh, like Phil Drago's cultural parent you're talking about, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Things mm -hmm. that have happened. Yeah. 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 <laughs> So I'm, I, I shared that simply because I was like, while I, I like the idea of the clarity, yes. I'm just thinking how do you even begin to work uh, in, a, in, in a context where... And, and it's an know. important point yeah. you make uh, uh, concerning t t cultural developments yeah. into a more separated world uh, a development and that these worlds have to have their own identity in order to have a a good interrelation. If everything is mixed up, it's difficult to have a positive, critical encounter of cultures. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. If you don't know yeah. what is part of which culture, yeah. who, who, what does encounter what. Yeah. And so this might yeah. might help to be developed. Um, the only problem uh, we talked about is that probably the notion of saying something is not okay with how it has been so far. Uh, it should be fixed uh, instead of the notion um, having said all in one box uh, get, brings problems of of get finding clarity with it. Maybe we should now make differences mm -hmm. that make a difference to get to come to more clarity. Then it's not yeah. then it's resource and solution oriented and not pathology oriented. <laughs> I know. I'm not sure. Where would you start? Is my question. <laughs> and it's not. It's not like what should we say? It's family businesses that have grown. But I'm. I'm even talking about you know multinational organizations that exist, mm -hmm. and I work in right, them. Right. But the employees have a certain mindset. I've had people sit through my training programs and not right. interact and be very passive, and I wondered, right. am I doing something yeah. that's not working? And then later had a conversation and found out that actually they've got someone in the hospital and they want to be there, but the organizations told them, no, you sit here. Yeah. So how, you know, and I see how non-productive that day is for that person, yeah. for me. But you do the right thing, you invite people in dialoguing, yeah. yeah. meta-dialoguing, meta and uh, here are contributions to a language tool. Yeah. yeah. So... And I always, uh, I already said it, you cannot underline enough the function of habits. Mm -hmm. So we have role habits. And this is a notion also with records. We all, um, we, we tend to understand red, records <coughs> as being maintained by some, by some kind of neurotic motivation. But many records are just cultural reflexes. So if you try to find out what the motivation is for that, change the motivation in the hope that the cultural ref reflexes will change, this might, might be a wrong way to do it. It's maybe much better to, find, to set up stages where you can practice new cultural reflexes in order to get an idea how it could be different and experience that this uh, is more worthwhile for you so your soul is interested to learn these new uh, ways of doing of dealing with things and then you lose your interest in the old habits <coughs> So, 
using the role model as a three worlds model. Three worlds model only says divided roles into roles in three worlds. And the class, it's very classical to divide between private world and professional world. That's people always, all over the world do. I suggest that you use a second division between organization world and professional world because it's quite often a different focus that elicits different backgrounds and different priority and steps to deal with, for example, in supervision. If somebody talks to me, comes to me to supervision and says, I'm a, I'm a psychologist, I want to become a coach more, and I'm right now I'm, I'm, I'm an employer coach in this and this company where coaching is understood and done in this or that way. And I have some problems with that or issues I want to develop. That it makes a difference to me whether this person mainly wants to learn how to function in the organizational role in this company with a background and frame of reference on coaching in this company or whether the person wants to deal with his or her understanding what a coach could be uh, not specified on one uh, company or being a coach in this company, but what can becoming a coach uh, me can mean um, related to the, the competences I need, related to the lifestyle I will adapt when I am a freelance coach, for example, related to my, uh, the history of professions in my family and the possible visions of what uh, to reach in life, being a coach. And these are uh, different contexts that are generated if you talk about being a coach from an organizational role perspective or from a professional world perspective. And this is why I separated it. And you also can use that for understanding the encounter between a professional culture and organizational culture. Culture. If you know who, are, who you are as a coach, for example, um, before the background of our German organization I've co-founded, then you know who you are besides that you have right now specific roles within a company. And to know standards of your profession gives you the position to contrast them with the uh, standards or ideas in the organization and only if you know who you are besides being identified with the organizational role then you can positively critically dialogue with your organization say from my point of view i understand that you want to fix up and calm down everything that's just something i probably would like to do as well if i would be in your role you want me as a coach to help with that from the I reality ideas of our profession, uh, we have this and this knowledge to that and this and this attitude for that. And I believe that could be a better way to come to your intended goal, but somehow we have to discuss um, uh, um, the re different realities who are encountering right that. So as an organization, you can think an organization as an, as an assembly of professions. And then you have the cultural encounter, uh, encounter model of communication. How can all these professions meet each other in a way that you will have complementary organizational roles after that? And this depends uh, on what kind of an organization do you want to have. Do you want to have an organization of, of professional people who know who they are? Then you cannot say what's the right, thing, right way is to be professional. Then you have really to have a, a, an open, discourse, um, learning conversation, dialogue, and you build up the organization in a way 
that it's a place for discussing ongoing developments uh, between autonomous professionals. And I want, I only want associations of such kind, not associations that tell people if you want to be a coach, you have to be that way, otherwise you are not one of us. Mm. And if, if they are working on organization or for an organization, they do the same thing. They tell them you, you have to understand how to deal with people the way I've learned in my organiz in my association. And then we have all this, this rigid, problems of encountering of cultures. That's one of the things that um, I found when I communicate this model to people is um, they often really, really want to hang on to the idea that there is a personality Beside. besides this. Yeah. How, do, how have you found ways to what do you communicate? Mean, Sorry? What in this model, what, what I understand Bert to be saying is personality is nothing other than the roles that we play. There is no personality, essence, rosariness, yeah. which is separate from the roles that yeah. I play. Yes, it has to do. Which is a very radical, very radical idea. Yes. Yeah. Because most of our culture in the pop, right. cult, pop psychology world, let alone so we have different personalities for different things, do you mean? Or that there is an essential so there's a personality. Uh, it's a, an essence besides what is, can be experienced. <laughs> right. So that's, that's cultural, that we uh, think there is essence somewhere, a core. Mm -hmm. This is why we want to dig deep, deep if we found the basis of a personality. Yeah. And I do jokes like this, but everybody who's gardening knows that it's fruitful on the surface, not when you dig deep. <laughs> so we, I, I somehow invite in a humorous way to understand that the notion of there's a core somewhere behind is, is, is a belief system like the notion that there is a God somewhere sitting on a cloud. And I invite uh, to understand that uh, there is no other life than uh, a minute by minute being lived, and this, and you can describe that in roles, stages, place, and so on. If you are interested, how you really live your life, this is the way you can describe it and think about it. But there might be something you feel that is besides that, and I'm not offending this. I say it's a didactic model to bring bring up questions on how do we live your life uh, according to the idea of Eric Byrne, real people, real life situation. That's for what we are oriented to and not mystifications. But there might be mystifications that really are... If you have a really a mystification of yourself, you can really believe in and feel satisfied with. It's wonderful. But that's nothing we can deal with in professional training. That's the question of region or spirituality. I'm glad that's come up because I'm sitting with the word personality around um, <coughs> the three words of personality around and I was thinking, is that me, the human being, in the triangle personality and there are my roles? Mm -hmm. Is that what that diagram means? Yeah. It does. Yeah. I, my understanding is it doesn't mean that. No. That it means that the personality is made up of these roles. Oh, yes. And so I, I didn't not, understand you right. It is, it is one of the problems with this picture, and I don't use this picture. Oh, okay. Because it looks like there is an yeah. essential thing yeah. called personality, mm -hmm. which then it's has the an outwards. Yeah, so yeah. The idea is this is these are roles, and they are direct to worlds. Yeah. This is the idea of the picture map. Maybe yeah, we find a better one. Yeah. I, I, yeah, no, yeah, yeah. I so say more of what you were saying before. Do you mind? Like around well, my understanding of this theory, and it's one of the things that I find very exciting about it, mm. is this notion that there is nothing else. Mm. We are the roles we mm. live. Mm. Okay. There is nothing mm. that is 
Mandy, mm. other than you know, at the moment there's Mandy in the yeah. role you're in mm. here, Stuart, yeah. and mm. I'm I have a notion that you have in the background lots of other roles oh. you play. Yeah, yeah. But that is Mandy. Right. And people might not uh, anything else. Yeah, not people no magical Mandy. Right. right. And oh, people might <laughs> and people might su suspect that this is uh, uh, very technical, but it's not mm, yeah. because the essence of your Unique personality is in the way you play your roles. Right. It's in the how. Oh, yes. It's not in the what, it's the how. Right. Yeah. In the how, yeah. Okay. And this helps you to, to, if people want to have a spiritual approach, want to uh, understand their uniqueness, they do not uh, look for it in some area uh, besides roles they play in life. They, they try to find it within the roles, mm -hmm. and that's my idea that helps them just to be much more happy, but also to be more critical on how they place their roles, mm -hmm. because <laughs> that's, that's, that's their soul, <coughs> right. they're expressing through their roles. So we are our roles. Mm -hmm. yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. yes. But it has, it, there's something about, we took a lot of kind of pop everything in, in culture about you know, the difference between being, and do it. Mm. And actually, if you're all mindful and everything, you know how to be, mm. which is kind of... Well, you can be in your role. Mm. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But but the role, but the role is a, has a function. Several there might be places. Yeah, yeah, no, no, I yes. see lots of yes. functions. Yes. Yes. But what I'm saying is that, so I'm, I'm just trying to work out how to... Um, no, no let's say of... let's say a role is expressing something. If you state it, it has yeah. a function, you make it functional too yeah, much. No, no, no. Uh, <laughs> there are also okay. roles in in, yeah. in, in uh, Shakespeare play or whatever. Yeah. They stand for quality, mm -hmm. the, the roles, right. and they express principles of life, putting into stage in 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 human relationships, mm. and you have. Or, or, or everything that makes sense you can put into roles. Otherwise, uh, all the Shakespeare's and Goethe's and so uh, couldn't have caught everything alive uh, in the um, pieces they put on stages. Mm. I find one of the words that Bert has used, carefully chosen word, I guess, in the article, is that we inhabit roles. Yeah. And to inhabit a role fully... I be in that role. Right. Mm -hmm. But when I'm torn between two or three different roles or mm -hmm. confused yeah. about my role, I'm mm -hmm. not inhabiting, mm -hmm. I'm not being mm -hmm. in my role. Right. Mm -hmm. And I might be doing a bit yeah. of pretending mm -hmm. to, mm -hmm. to try and yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Which is why I wanted to say this afternoon I need to mm -hmm. go and declap the car no, I in a <laughs> private role <laughs> because otherwise it will yeah. inhabit. inhabit my right. role yeah. here. Right. Whatever I call yeah. that one. And still it doesn't mean I'm totally identified with my role. Transpersonal psychology, for example, and all spiritual traditions teach you to live your roles, but being not totally identified with them, have a meta sense to them, knowing that you are always more than the one role. But whether you are more than all the roles you play, I don't know. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Better you should think, okay, that's all then. Uh, I have a m much responsibility to play my roles good because they are unorthodox. Once, this is what I can do in life. Yeah. And for me, this is very important. This goes back to the previous topic, but it's very important, I find, mm -hmm. when working with TA people. Yes. Uh, because this really clarifies that it is a psychological model, not a just a sociological you just do it, it it's also a psychological yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's not only yeah. yeah. it's one layer of meaning <laughs> the model makes <laughs> yeah. and, and I find some of my colleagues psychotherapy colleagues some yeah. of them find it deeply shocking yes this idea mm -hmm. and some mm. particularly those from the more constructivist more contemporary perspectives in TA find it a great relief mm -hmm. so Mm -hmm. Because I think there's definitely a kind of set of ways of talking between the, as we move to a bigger, un, get better understanding mm -hmm. of this, there's definitely mm -hmm. a need for creative communication mm -hmm. around it, because it's very resist, one resists yeah. if one believes yeah. one has an essence. Yeah. Yeah. How dare yes. you? 
Yeah. And there's a very interesting development in philosophy at the moment, which is very much around this idea of the difference between the pearl philosophies yeah. and the bundle philosophies. Yeah. Yeah. And the pearl can grow and get layers and layers and layers. But the bundle is a bundle where you can drop some things and get some new things. There is mm. no essence. The pearl has an essence. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's a, it's I think that's a nice metaphor. Yeah. Mm. I stayed in with the mosaic idea of personality. Mm. Yeah. And you can yeah. put new things to it and then the, the, the picture changes. A mosaic without cement. Without? Cement. Yeah. <laughs> I I'm thinking of... Um, uh, you know, in terms of contamination and role um, inhabiting, um, as I've noticed within myself, so in my private world, as the eldest daughter mm -hmm. of a, you know, a large family, mm -hmm. and being in organisational roles and mm -hmm. professional roles of mm -hmm. my tendency to get into a parental role, mm -hmm. a big learning has been around not doing that, mm -hmm. yet uh, some aspects that are really good, <coughs> the skills that are being really good in that way, but I can, um, and you might reshape them if you use the skills from a different role. Yes. The skills are good, but if they are lived with the implications of a, of a private role, yes. they are wrong. So yes. you have put the skills out yes. of the implications and consequences of one role world and put it into another role world and put them together again. and, and the, uh, competence to do this, this is what we call meta-professionality. Uh, you do not only learn to change the understanding of your roles, you learn how you do that because you will have to do it more often in your life because our whole system of roles and understanding of professions and culture of organization will change all the time. So you, you, it's not enough um, to, to be trained into a professional tradition, it's important that you, while you're doing that, you understand how this tradition is constructed, that you can construct new traditions if you need that. It's a habit. Mm. Yeah, it's a, ha it's a passion to change. Yes, yes. yes. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Mm. And you see ma many tribes, the Aborigines, for example, or Indians in America, if their traditions are broken, uh, they don't know what to do. They're totally out of track because they did not learn and understand how to reshape their, the values of their tradition into new roles and new, and new worlds. And, and if we that's extremely sad, but if we won't learn it today now, we will be tomorrow the Aborigines. Mm. We can see drunk around the stars in Sydney. Mm. Makes you in New Zealand, they, um, I was thinking when you were mentioning before around um, in India and organisations, in New Zealand there's been a, a huge resurgence of Maori culture. Mm -hmm within organisations mm -hmm. and uh, reliving past traditions mm -hmm. and merging it within organisations mm -hmm. um, around what I think they would term the essence of being Maori in that being that ethnic group. Mm -hmm. um, it's, an it's been interesting to be part of some of that, of incorporating that within the work that happens within organisations. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. So this is um, you. You also can use this picture for purposes uh, that I didn't think of when I produce it. For example, for balancing your life and your identity. Yeah. Do you know who you are privately? Do you know who you are professionally? Do you know who you are as an organizational member? And if don't don't um, bring too much movement in all of the three worlds at once. So if you have a, a, a clarified private life that gives you the basis of changing your professional understanding, or if you know who are professionals, then you have 
more space to deal with your organizational role, more freedom to do so. Um, so you can use it to think about your balance. Some people think you should always be in balance with these three parts. I don't think so. There are people who can express themselves and come to themselves only by doing their work. Work, life is a valid part of life. And there are others, they work and work and work and lose everything. So it's not a question of the right balance. It's, but the model invites you to talk about balances that are right for you in different phases of your life. So, in terms of GA, you see it's a functional model. That's a model just describing what's on the surface, what I can experience right now. It is not automatically tied to some kind of history. And it's not that there are specific ways to describe roles. And you couldn't do it very uh, <coughs> metaphorical by using the theater metaphor without any training of clearly differentiated behaviors, attitudes, feelings, and things like that. And it's a model that is connecting person with the world by definition not by additional questioning. And the three worlds models is just didactic. I told you why I made this differentiation between professional and organizational world. If you are not interested for a specific question to make that differentiation, just to take a two-fold model, private and professional, that's enough. Or like Günther Mohr, uh, because he was uh, did he was very much interested in your engagement in the smaller private life and your community engagement. And this is why he made a fourfold model. Community world, private world, professional world. But as I always say, uh, a functional model, you remember this picture of spotlights, it's no question uh, to put two spotlights here and here where you have had one here. If the light of these two different spotlights give you differences that make a difference for what you are heading for. It's, a, it's, it's not a question of truth, it's a question of in what light do I want to show the object in order to make differences that make a difference. That's very practical. Mm. We had that with Rosemary turning lights off to just to, to show yeah, yeah. to show the uh, the artwork over here yeah. because we see it differently with yes. different lights on and off. Yes, and I I, I had a <laughs> interesting experience in my in my group room at home when 15 years ago we wanted to make video tapes a lot. I thought we do not have enough lamps. The cameras have not been so. Uh, tolerant to darkness at then. And so I've put six more uh, lamps at the ceiling thinking more light is, be is better is a better picture. It was not. <laughs> so I learned from that metaphor it's not the question of having every light on. It's the question of having the right light on mm -hmm. that you see what you want to see. <laughs> And this, uh, this affords that you can switch off lights. Otherwise, you have problems to see what two spotlights, for example, can tell you. If all the other lights have been engaged at the same time, it's more difficult to understand. But this means you have to be aware of what you want, in what light do you want to see the object. And this is systemic. So you're responsible for the way you approach reality. Because the way you approach reality creates reality. Invites others into reality. So to realize means to real a life.
I guess I said it now already, but I want to show you just the open ladder model, I, model I've uh, introduced into the many years ago, but uh, it did not find too much resonance bec because it's abstract, it has to be defined. The functional model on the left side, it's predefined and it's tied to its structural model. What is wrong? Because it's not really, re has to be tied. Uh, but you know with what content of categories you want to work. I said um, if they are functions and they are not bound to structures, it's very open how you define that function. It depends on what you, are want, you want to observe and how many different categories you make. It should not be five, it can be two or ten. depends on how, what differences you want to make that make a difference for what you are working for. But you can then use the classical ways of uh, working with arrows and cross transactions and uh, foreground level and behi levels behind. You have seen that already. So if you use this three world model then you might define uh, three areas of roles concerning to these three worlds and then you can for example use it for the question of role uh, of um, cross transactions in terms of role changes mm. during communication mm. so let mm. for example the first uh, message is I'm the boss of HR, you are my employed coach. This is a strategy of how we deliver our service, I think uh, is right and I want to discuss with you how to, to enact with this strategy. Second is okay, um, we have to find out how the strategy, uh, what that means, what the implications of your ideas are and the consequences, how we have to organize ourselves, what, uh, what competences we need and then the left person says yeah and please involve these and these people in finding out whether this is appropriate to our company, whether they understand it, what you do and so on. And at this point um, the person on the right might think oh that doesn't sound right to me, how can I have engineers and customers have a voice in how I have to uh, develop my product and begins a discussion on uh, who has the competence to think about strategy with the person on the left but forgetting that this person can define how it has to be done within the organization role and if this person who is maybe is not a psychologist or not a trained coach may felt pressed at the wall and then they are fighting who has the right to define it. This, if this person goes into uh, discussing it on a knowledge level then they both uh, shifted from an organizational discussion to a professional peer discussion. And maybe behind that there is a private rivalry between these two men. This can be that's a, in the, one of the background processes might be the rivalry between two men in their private role. I, so, so the way to state this is familiar to you and you can use it with in a functional model with putting in roles and world uh, uh, divided in the worlds that are suggested or changing, just changing it how you need it. So for example you can um, not talk about professional roles at that point but different uh, organizational role relationship you and me have. One is that I'm your boss and can you tell me what to do? The other is that you're some kind of supervisor to support you in your career within your role. It 
could be that I have to uh, confront you with consequences, be the controller of you, or the one who has, has the right to state orientations, to decide on orientations for our efforts we have to do. And so you build different categories in a functional model and see when I talk to you as somebody to be confronted with whether you try to switch to a, another part of our overall organizational role relationship and then it's a gross transaction in TA terms. Mm. So it's a very to be defined open model <coughs> and this is in a other metaphor like the, the <coughs> computer programs are today. They are what makes us stress as well. Um, the, the camera can do everything, but it has to be defined. And when I do not know how to define it, I think it's not good that camera. I would prefer a camera yeah, that yeah. the things I need are predefined, <laughs> then it, it is not so complicated for me to use a camera. That's a question of compromise. But in principle, I should know that even if I have a camera, many things are predefined. If the predefinitions do not satisfy me, I can uh, change the definitions in the camera and not have to buy a new camera. Can I just ask you something? Where would you put the transference processes in that, if you ever would? <laughs> that depends on uh, what your notion of transference is. Uh, in psychology, transference means um, that experiences with early important others are reactivated and without being conscious of that, put on the persons you have to do with now. Rosemary in her article, for example, expanded that on transference on milieus, on contexts, on organizations, that's a quite new notion, notion in, in psychology, uh, then the question is very different. Uh, if you go back to a very basic understanding of transfer, something is transferred into how we talk about, then you can uh, ask for example questions, the way we are ta talking about now or we are uh, very careful not to not to be become intimate from where do you know that I said oh that's the way in my in my team whenever we try to be intimate somehow it went uncomfortable so I transfer an experience from there to here this might be transference between different stages at present and this has not much to do with the psychoanalytical analytical understanding of transference. So depends on what you want to describe by transference. I would also see things like um, in the workplace with a boss, the person in the professional role might transfer the relationship from private roles with their father as head of the family yeah. to the boss in organizational yeah. role. So it's a transfer of role, right. um, putting another role, if you like, on somebody's yeah. face from another world yeah. or from an old world yeah. rather than the current world. And most of the time we, we deal, this is because of our tradition in psychology, we deal with transferring, transferring as something disturbing actual reality. But uh, if you ask a person, how come you have the competence of uh, having conflicts with people in your football association and you believe not to have the competence in your team? Could we transfer your competence from the one stage and the one play to the other play? That's a total different uh, notion to transference. And I think uh, we much too much uh, try to educate people on in each world and in each stage, each role and each place separately. Mm. But economically that's nonsense. Because many of these people already have many elements of what they need and education should mean to help them to transfer adequately 
into new contexts, new roles, or new stages, in new, into new styles. And this is basically the thinking of Milton Erickson. He overdid it somehow. He said, it's everything within you. It's not everything within me. Some things when I have, uh, I cannot just transfer <coughs> knowledge from a private world to a, a big company. <coughs> I have to learn a lot in addition, culturally, in order to uh, function there. So the notion of everything is in you, I only want to remind you, that's a romantic, naturalistic understanding. But the basic idea is that you have more components you need for this learning process than you think. Let's check how this is in other worlds, what we can gather together and transfer it into the new world or new role. This is a very important and economical, meaningful way to deal with learning and changes our attitude to education. Can I ask you, how does that fit with something you said yesterday around um, there's very little transference in, the, the closer we are when we're learning to the reality that we have to use that learning, uh, then um, the, the more like Peters will do it. And actually that there's not a huge crossover if you learn something over here, but you need it here. Yes, yeah, not a, 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 a not an automatic crossover. Yeah. But Literally. if you if you have the idea, the person has learned a lot in this section. Yeah. Then you 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 put these two be, uh, beside each other on the screen and find out whether okay. you can actively learn to transfer for it. Yeah. But so if you, you if you just believe it's some working some kind of a in some kind of a principle learning mode, and it transfers itself. This is not supported by the, by the research. Yeah. Okay. So it's it's more so it's bringing it to the forefront, yeah. isn't mm -hmm. it? Foreground and looking. Yeah. So so you can understand yeah. an educator as an uh, transference yeah. facilitator. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And be, and we, uh, in our culture, uh, there's a lot of diversity. There are people from big companies, small companies, profit companies, not profit companies, IT companies, social care companies. And, and they learn together. And our role is to organize a learning culture to make them possible to constructively teach each other the knowledge of their worlds and help to transfer. Mm -hmm. And that's the that's the teaching of the future. Not telling not, not telling people how it is to be in their world, but helping them to, to learn from others. Mm -hmm. And if you do so, you do not need so many teachers. But it's a different different role understanding of the function of a teacher. Mm -hmm. And in even in the University of Education in Heidelberg, who should be specialized on that. For example, they do not have a peer learning over generations. Mm. And the teacher teaches each new yeah. generation himself, instead of them teach each other, and I supervise you how you do that. Mm. And you will be teachers later. The way what you learn while teaching others is what you have to learn anyway, because you will be a specialist on education. Mm. If you don't manage to do that, simple thing. Mm -hmm. And they are always have too big groups, too much workload on the teachers, and that's the same in school. Mm -hmm. uh, and this has a lot to do with structures, that mm -hmm. each class is separate uh, and all these things. But also if, I, if, I'm, if, I, if a teacher says to me, I'm teaching you to be a learner and also a teacher, yes. at the same time, then my, the way I see and hear yes. is different. Right. Because I'm thinking of um, a lot of the managers I'm working with have been frontline staff to mm -hmm. begin with, you know, therapists and uh, social workers, this mm -hmm. kind of thing. And then they've come to the management role yes. and they their issues around it, uh, around managing, full of anxiety and all these things, they haven't often the awareness from our encounters and encounters with each other is, I know how to do this with 
when I'm being the social worker or anything, right. I know how to do all of the, all of these yeah. are my skills. I just didn't. I, just I have to reshape it yeah, for new I roles and new and new contexts. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's, really, that's, that's, that's very interesting. That's true. And and some things really have to be different in your yes, roles absolutely. and your context. Yeah, and, what and many things can stay the same, but they are different in a different context. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And but the empowerment that comes with just that realization. Yes. That, right. Yeah. It's just saying you've got transferable skills and meaning until yes. you context. Yeah. Let me see where we are. We need to have a break. But I, I would like to finish it up before we take the break. Is that mm -hmm. okay? Or? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, I've given you already an example. And to me, as I, I said before, um, Personality, because it's not freeing natural personality, it's always a question of of competence. Sorry. So somehow the implication of humanistic psychologies, for example, are if you are freed from negative experiences, then you grow automatically to be autonomous and so on. And this might work for some aspects. But in professional world and in organizational world, <laughs> it's not enough. It's always combined with adopting competencies and knowledge. And this is why, for me, the question of competence is, is, cannot be separated from the question of personality in the professional world. But even in the private world, if you are not competent deal with your marriage, you are, cannot be free to have a good marriage. Only because all of your tra traumatic stuff is uh, worked through. If it works fine, then you learn it because you are no longer limited to learning, but you have to learn it. It's certainly also a question of competence. Mm. So, at our institute, <clears throat> we de I developed a, um, an equation for competence. It's also a didactic thing to raise specific questions. That was by somebody called the Wiesloch, this the town I'm coming from, formula for professional competence, and I ad adopted it. So competence, and this in relation to a world, or an organization, for example, means role competence, that you know how to play your role. It's competence, context competence, competence in the professional field you are, and it has to do with whether it's, it fits to me, to what am I, whatever I am. Especially in creative, if you need, a, uh, there's a great, a bigger creative part uh, in my performance, then my soul has to be with it. My passions have to be with it. But if it doesn't fit me, I might know how the role has to be played and how the play is going, but <coughs> I will not have much impact because people sense whether my soul is in it or not. So it, does it make meaning to me or not? So making meaning is also a, a, a basis of the power of influence. And in the theater metaphor terms, this means if somebody is not, seems not to play very well, then it, you have to check whether the person doesn't understand the play or is not introduced to the play much, or whether the person just don't know, doesn't know how to play a role of a king or whatever. So if a person, if the play is not going well, you have to think whether it's right to send everybody back to artist school to learn more role competence. Because if the play is good and they understand the play, then they quickly learn to do all the transference from what they know already uh, to make meaning of the role within that world and that play. And many people may become also to your groups uh, 
who want uh, to learn more role competence but do not understand how things are going in the fields they are working in. And then it's important to check with them whether they want to learn more on the right edge. Maybe they need to learn more on the different edge. So the three components of competence are put together by the times sign here. This is saying if role competence is a minimum, it doesn't help that you know how the play is going or it does, would make meaning to you because you can just not play your role. If you want to get better, you need, it's much more economical to invest into enhancement of role competence. Sometimes people try to invest into role competence, but the play is not good, or the, direct, the directing of the play is not good. The script is, doesn't make sense. So it's for the company much more meaningful to invest to, into better understanding of the context, or even investing in making the context understandable, so that people can naturally learn. And that even people who are mediocre can play their roles because the play is good. And so uh, the being directed of the play is good. If the play is not good, and then the competence of the players must be much higher in order still to f come to a, a way of playing that makes sense. Uh, but we do not have the means and the time, uh, for example, in organizations to train all people on that level of competence. It makes much more sense to build up a good culture that people who do not even know out of their own maps of reality how to put the play, they get so many impulses from others who play their roles well, that they are invited into playing their roles also well. I've, I've, I'm an inquiry, and um, in the beginning, sometimes I was angry at the director of the choir because he, he invited us to sing together six layers <coughs> of voices without each voice has learned her part, uh, its part. So that how could we sing together uh, when each of us does not know how to sing? But then I found out that's a question of balance, so I should at least know a bit how I have to sing. But when I learn to listen how the other things, and the more they get better, they give me uh, the impulses to understand how I should sing. Uh, I sing. And so, in a very unordinary way from my formal perspective, we came at the end to a wonderful perf performance. And this is a metaphor and we should, uh, for that. And we should not uh, stick to the old metaphor that each has to autonomously know how to sing his song and maybe sing it so good that everybody else uh, can learn from him, but teach many people at a time how they can inspire each other and give each other um, clues to get better. So, and this is building up learning culture and that's more than individual training. And as a systemic, in the beginning we thought we know about pattern. As a, as a humanistic psychologist, we know about people. And because we know about pattern, you can make use of our competence everywhere because we can translate everything into pattern. Somehow we could, but we miss the point that because we do not have the field competence, we do not understand which pattern are important or which not. So we got more and more models and say, okay, you also have to be a specialist in your field when you want a professional to be a professional. So, by this competence, it's not only a property of a person, but of a system. There's a systemic way to understand competence. 
and it can be differentiated into role competence and context competence. And it differentiates by this competence to play the role and competence to understand the play. And competence depends on how well the individuals, individuals and the organizations match, how it makes sense to people and how it makes sense to, to the organization. Sometimes they come up to a place that is wonderful for those who play, but when you look at it closer for the company, it doesn't make much sense. So it's not enough that the players are satisfied. <clears throat> and thus we come to the question of matching. And what most people like is ask, is this organization matching with me? Do I make sense to this? Uh, do, does this organization make sense to me? But certainly it's vice versa. The organization have to think about does this person and this orientation and reality make sense to us? And we should have uh, other discussion on that. We call that a matching discussion culture. And this is uh, a schema. So that uh, matching is done, is to be done by the individual or the management and the employee? The matching just, is just an idea. And then we have the question, who has a problem with matching? Is, and and the, uh, representatives of the organizations should talk to the individuals. And this could be your boss talking to you or your HR manager talking to you. The invitation we had yesterday yeah. together in a conversation could be uh, stated as an invitation <coughs> into a matching discussion. Yeah. And do you make, does the, the work the organization offers make sense to you, mm -hmm. but do the way you want to work makes sense to the organization. Mm -hmm. And you need to have a dialogue on matching. <coughs> and there's no predefined way of doing it right or wrong. But mm -hmm. it should match, otherwise it would not work. So then, if I am in a role where I am meeting various people, yes. then this matching has to be done with various other people. Yes. And this is now ideal, but it raises questions that can be used everywhere. This is a question for the individual. What is your professional identity? What is your identity you bring in, in a possible organizational function? And what are, what are the core competencies that are yours? And for example, he's saying, my identity is to be an organizational developer because that's I'm betrayed in. That's my professional identity. And my core competence is uh, designing, designing changes. So here the metaphor, scripting. Not only having some ideas how to do it, but really think about with the resources available within the time possible, using the level the leverages we have what what kind of play can we do then to writing the script that's my core competence and it might be that on the other side the organization has to think about what is our core business uh, who are we as a, as a company and what are our core processes through which we do the core business. And in a significant relationship to that should be defined the organizational role. And it might be that the organizational function is mainly, uh, let's say, to keep... Uh, we, uh, we have to change organizationally, we have to restructure things, uh, we have several subdivisions of our company and they all have their own right to develop how they want. That's our culture up to now. And we need somebody in the function of an organizational developer who is very much capable, capable to talk to everybody, to keep them in a cooperative mood and uh, 
supports them in the way they want to develop. And if this company hires somebody, uh, the person I've described before, then there might be a mismatching. Also, many things are matching. It's really an organization, development, trained person, but the core competencies of this person is not that what is the core competence that is needed in the organizational function. And certainly, as soon as this person will have this new job, the person will try to tell everybody which place to play. But this is not the reality of, of the organization, and they will soon be uh, involved in a power struggle between central units and departments. And this has to do with mismatching uh, in, in giving the job to this kind of professional. And this is why it's very much important uh, to have a, a matching dialogue going on when you start a job, but things are changing all the time, polity may change, and then you have uh, you have to discuss whether the core competencies of so this person who is holding the job is still the core competence the company needs on that place. And if not, you, it's important to find out how, what you can change. So that's a matching system circle. And this you get that? Mm -hmm. yeah, so, and certainly the prob this, uh, this picture also, also tells you that organizational development uh, and matching always has to do, uh, no, um, that the efficiency of a professional in an organizational role has a lot to do with the matching. So you cannot development develop efficiency of people within organization roles without thinking in organizational development. It's so everybody who is a specialist for organization should uh, have ideas for both sides and how to match them to each other. It doesn't have to do everything on its, on its own, but knowing that both have to go together in order to help the organization and, and not only the development of self-understanding of the professional. And we often train people into changes that come to a mismatch with the organization. And then we say, I could do that a lot, a good job, but the organization doesn't let me do that job. Say, Did you ever check out what they want? <coughs> the change you want? <coughs> and if organizations send people to us and pay for it, what to third do? Uh, and when they come to our learning cultures, they find out, oh, this is so different than the culture I'm coming from, I will have more and more conflicts when I go with that. Then we ask the company sending them, this is what will happen. Is that what, what you want to pay for? So it doesn't make to sense to send this person to us to become more competent if you are not ready to change the role configuration in which the person then will work. Otherwise, we train the, the person into depression or into conflict with you or whatever. And many companies never thought about that. Mm -hmm. So that will come in rich matching then. When you say that that you also have to yeah. make changes in the environment. Right. So where that fits in here in this picture? Uh, so the identity changes and the core competencies. Of, of the person. Of the employee who comes. Of the employee. But the, the, the function and the cultural embedment of the function stays the same. So certainly he comes back and says, well, let's do a lot of change, let's do multi-layer communication, being open to everybody. But they do not, never thought they, they, they want to have that change. They only wanted to function him better within their frame of reference. So you you develop the person into a mismatching. What might be constructive, but <laughs> you need to know what you do. No, but that's very interesting what you're saying, because what I find happening quite often when people are using this kind of approach is that people end up leaving the organization yes. quite quickly, but very happily. 
wrist? There we are. <laughs> yes. As an, as an entrepreneur, I, I would not pay for that. Of course, that's what I mean. <laughs> I say, okay, if you, want to do it, if you want to do that, then you pay it on your own, because it's an exactly. investment in your professional world, not in, in the organizational it's really world. It's really a breaking up of the contract that you have done with the organization right. as right. a consultant when you obtain this kind of results. Right. But the people live very happily, actually. Right. And, and, most, and it's not healthy at all. And for most organizations do not care. Yeah, they do not have exactly, an understanding exactly. how they should better use their money. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If they ask me, I tell them, think about it, I'm an entrepreneur myself. Mm -hmm. I would never uh, pay, except it's a part of a deal that makes sense to me, uh, my employee to develop a, a professional identity within that this person cannot do my, the work in my institute any longer. For example, my, uh, my Geschäftsführer, Uh, my director, mm -hmm. uh, he's, he's trained in, in coaching and things like that. And I clearly told him to be a director means to be a manager here and not to, not to do groups. It's, we have people who do groups. You have to decide whether you want to do that or not. And when you want to have more training uh, in your job here, then it's not how to better conduct groups. It's how to better to manage a, a educational business. Mm -hmm. And if you want to become a group leader, that's fine with me, but it's not uh, something I have to invest in, because I want my business to be run. We can then find a fair deal, but we mm -hmm. have to be clear that we know what we are doing here. And some of them, my employees, decided, oh, uh, it's a really highly qualified educational management job, but it's too much management for me. I want really to work with people directly. So that's fine, but then you have to change roles, organizational roles. You cannot, you cannot be an employee who has to uh, um, care for our culture and not being here because you prefer to be on workshops. Many organizations just accept that. That the head of a consulting department is the one who is most off outside doing workshops mm -hmm. because they did not clarify that they need really the person in the organization role. They only thought, oh, he's qualified in coaching, then it's okay to hire him. But they did not find out that his core interests and competencies are not managing a department like that. I, I think this You're raising very interesting issues. Maybe could we take it back after the break? Well, because uh, I think, anytime. Yeah, because I think it raises a lot of interesting issues in terms of the work we all do with organizations. Yes. Mm -hmm. okay. So I, I would like to. Yes, yes, uh, I'd like <laughs> So this is not what I uh, uh, wanted to bring here under the headline TA, but certainly that's what we deal every, with every day in our exactly. training groups. Exactly.